Now back out here in paradise, I mean, look at him. How pathetic can you get? Look at the expression on that creature's face. You know, he's, he's self, he's sated like someone who's just eaten a gallon of ice cream. And he's got this pathetic, self-satisfied, naive, clueless, unconscious grin on his face, which the animators did a very nice job of capturing. Like, that's a complicated expression. And you just want to slap him. And that's exactly what should happen, and that's exactly what does happen. So anyways, he's out there being an unconscious dingbat Well, his society is degenerating, and that's bloody well worth thinking about, because that's an archetypal trope, right? It's like things are sinking around you. The question is, what are you doing about it? You know, are you just staying in kind of a blithe unconsciousness because you can get your next meal? Or are you going to wake up and do something about it? Well, that's the call of the self. So now we go back to, to uh, Rafiki here. And, he knows what's going on in the kingdom. He's a symbol of the self. And he also has some inkling that Simba is still alive. So, so the son of the king is still alive, despite the fact that the, 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 uh, the land has become ruled by a tyrant and the son is absent. He's still around somehow. And so in a Jungian, from the Jungian perspective, there isn't much distinction between the self and the, and the, and the child. The self is the sum total of all possibility, and the child is possibility itself. And so, so let's say you've become an adolescent, you're all cynical, right? And, and everything's falling apart around you, which is the typical state of human beings, right? Because adolescents are cynical, generally speaking, and everything's falling, around, falling apart around them, generally speaking. And so, what do you have to do in order to, to do something about that? Well, one is, you have to be drawn by the call of wisdom. And the other part is that you have to rediscover that part of yourself that's a childlike part that's associated with the sun and associated with that early, you know, the early exposure of Simba to the sun. You have to find that again and then trust that some childlike exploration and a bit of manifestation of faith might get you to the next place. And so that's what's happening here with the little you know, the baboon in the tree and the, and the drawing. So anyways, he knows that Simba's alive now. And so he goes off to find him. And, and meanwhile, Simba and his dopey companions are out hunting for bugs, you know, because he's a lion, you know, he shouldn't be eating bugs for crying out loud, but they're easy. And so you see this scene where Pumbaa goes after this bug and then another lion shows up and chases him. So she's going to kill him and eat him. And, uh, ha, see, that's an interesting thing, because one of the things that happens, I suppose you could think about this, one of the things that happens in late adolescence is that the formation of male gangs is often broken up by the proclivity of one or more members of that gang to get involved in an individual romantic relationship. And so the idea that the female lion is the carnivore, the female is the carnivore that will devour the group is exactly right. And so what a girl will do often if she's um, in a relationship with, you know, somebody like a young man or an older adolescent is she'll try to separate him from his dopey friends and like, no wonder, you know, why wouldn't she do that? Because he does have dopey friends and it'd be better for him if he could get beyond them. And so anyways, they're pretty freaked out about this. And so then Simba goes out and has a fight with this lion to protect his dopey chums. And I'm sure you don't need any explanation about what that means. And, uh, they have this huge fight and Nala, who it turns out to be, pins him. And so that goes back to the beginning of the story where when he first encountered her, she pinned him all the time. She's an anima figure, right? And now what she does immediately is shame him. So she, he's an anima figure in part. She's an anima figure in part because she actually does shame him, right? So she's the gateway to higher consciousness. She makes him self-conscious and rightly so. But he, he's also a, she's also a psychological figure because imagine that when a young man is establishing a relationship with a young woman and he's, he's uh, enamored of her, he's falling in love, he projects an ideal onto her and that ideal is going to be partially fulfilled by the relationship, the degree to which is unspecified and sometimes it'll collapse completely. But he projects an ideal onto her because otherwise he wouldn't be attracted to her and then the ideal judges him. And so that makes him feel all self-conscious and and useless, which is useful because he is useless and should feel that way. And so it's part of the impetus to growing up. So, and of course, one of the, 
you need necessity in order to mature you because to mature is to take on responsibility and you're not going to feel that impetus unless adopting the responsibility has some sort of payoff and women tend to mate across an up dominance hierarchy so they tend to actually like men who are useful and so if they encounter a man who isn't useful at all they're gonna that's exactly what's going to happen they're gonna not be happy about that in the least and so and no wonder and I think the reason for that it's an economic and a biological reason the reason is is that women are in the position of having to take care of infants primarily and an infant is a very heavy load and so even a woman who's extraordinarily competent is going to find herself substantially limited in her possibilities if she has an infant and so then she's looking around for someone who will pick up part of the load it's perfectly reasonable and you're not going to pick up part of the load if you're completely useless and so it's in the woman's best interest not to have two children roughly speaking so anyway she pins them and then he's all resentful about it immediately because she's calling him on his stupid friends and the fact that he's out there gallivanting impulsively in paradise when there's real problems to be solved and so look at him he's all resentful and useless and and you know feeling put upon and picked upon and you just you got to slap him again fundamentally and she's just completely stunned by that it's like and tells him you know where's the simba i used to know right well uh, he's a little doubtful about the whole situation there um, the animators do a very nice job of this part of the movie because one of the things you see is that his eyebrows are always pointing up in the middle whereas his father's eyebrows were pointing down in the middle and so that's the difference between this which is sort of like things are happening to me and this which is more like I'm imposing my will on things and that's an immature face and, and the animators capture that brilliantly so here's where she shames him again she s tells him how much she liked him when he was little and, and you know a potential king and how hurt she is that he's this useless, you know, wide-eyed, naive, impulsive, pleasure-seeking adolescent. And uh, she tells him that she missed him. And God only knows why, because look at him again. It's like <laughs> completely appalling, appalling creature. And uh, this is when Pumbaa and Timon sing that song about the fact that, you know, their friend's doomed because, you know, this girl's got him and... Uh, and then they switch into another archetypal scene and so they're falling in love here and so the paradisal imagery is really highlighted in the movie and so they go off and have this like romp self-reflective romp through this new paradise and uh, they wrestle around and, and uh, play and then uh, he pins her more or less and she licks him that's, that's not so good and this is one of the most brilliant shots, I think, that the animators managed because she's obviously pushing this a little bit farther than he knows what to do with. And so they're wrestling and he, she licks him and then she lays down and makes this face, which is every single class I've ever showed this to all laugh when they see that image. And that's a good example. So Freud said that jokes were a good route into the unconscious. So the question is, and this is an archetypal facial expression and everyone knows exactly what it means there's something sexually seductive about it uh, something very sexually seductive about it despite the fact that it's a lioness and uh, the animators do an extraordinarily good job of capturing that and so that has a huge effect on him well these guys know that <laughs> like, <laughs> the game's up man it's like they know they're dead uh, whatever attractions they can offer are paling in comparison to this so so anyways, things don't really progress past that, but, you know, he gets a hint of her longing for him, what's waiting for him if he grows up, and the fact that she's completely disappointed in him because he's so completely useless. And so now he's lounging about, you know, like some basement dweller with Cheeto dust all over his chest and, <laughs> and trying to justify his absolutely useless life and, you know, saying that, he doesn't have any responsibility to the devastated kingdom and he's out there where hakuna matata, you know, I can just do whatever I want and, and follow my impulsive pleasures and she thinks he's pretty pathetic and the reason for that is, is because he is actually pretty pathetic and she, she tells him that, you know, she's extraordinarily disappointed and he gets all pouty about it. I mean, even here you see when, he, when he's got kind of an aggressive look on his face, there's still nothing about it that's commanding, it's petulant, right? It's like, well, now I'm irritated, but he's got no force and, and still 
completely appalling in this, in this particular situation. So she judges him very harshly and leaves. And that makes him think. Yeah, he make, gets all self-conscious because this female that he admires wants to have nothing to do with him. And so he's, first of all, then he thinks, well, maybe I'll just hate all women, which is, you know, a pretty pathetic conclusion, and, but a very common one. And the next is, well, maybe there's actually something wrong with him, right? Which is a very painful bit of self-reflection. So he... He, had, he notes that there's something wrong with him and then he calls out to his father and says, look, you said you were always going to be here for me and you're not. And so what's happening is that he's, he's become aware of the insufficiency of his current adolescent value structure and he wants something beyond it which would be associated with identification with the father. But he can't, he can't find the father. The father's dead. It's like when Pinocchio goes down to the bottom of the ocean to bring Geppetto up from the depths, right? That's the situation that that Simba finds himself in right now. The father's gone and has to be brought up from the depths. So this is where the movie takes the, the, the archetypal pathway of an initi initiation ceremony. So he says he wants to change. Now one of the things Carl Rogers, one of the clinicians that we'll talk about, pointed out was that if, if someone was going to come to psychotherapy, there's some things that had to happen before they went into psychotherapy. And one thing that had to happen was that they had to admit that there was something wrong and they had to want to change. You had to have that before you went into the psychotherapeutic situation. And what happens here is Simba is actually, he's dropped his arrogance, and he's looking upward, kind of like Geppetto wishing on the star in Pinocchio. He's looking upwards, he, looking towards something higher, and he wants to transform himself. So he's asked the question, how can I change for the better? And he doesn't get an answer. And then, Rafiki shows up. So what does that mean? It means that as soon as you know you're wrong about something, as soon as you admit that you're wrong about something, and you open the door to potential change, that part of you will respond. So, and you know this because, think about this. You're thinking. So you ask yourself a question, because that's what you do when you're thinking, and then you generate some answers. It's like, it's very strange. The thinking will actually work. You can actually come up with answers if you think about something. And so this, this issue is, okay, I thought I was real good in my little impulsive paradise, but then it turns out that I'm just a half-wit, and I noticed that, and I want to do something about it. So the question is now, the question is, has now been posed, and what Jung would say is, the deeper part of yourself, the part that still contains your undeveloped potential, will respond to that posed question, and change the way that you look at things, and change the way that you act. It'll start, it'll start changing things, so that you can tap those parts of yourself that are not yet developed. And you certainly do that in psychotherapy, but you can do that. Jung said that psychotherapy could be replaced by a supreme moral effort. And by that he meant was that if you really wanted things to be better, if you wanted to get your act together, and you admitted that you were insufficient in your current state, and you meditated on the issue and tried to figure out what you should do next to make, to put yourself together, that you would be able to find out that there's something in you that guides the process of development. That's the self. It's, a higher, it's the higher self, in some sense. It's the thing that remains constant across transformations. You know, because you're somewhere, then you fall apart, then you get somewhere else. But there's something outside of that that's guiding that process. And that's, that's also the self. That's what you could be. And you can communicate, in some sense, with what you could be. And that's a very strange thing about human beings. Anyways, Rafiki shows up, and Simba is sitting by the water, self-reflecting, and there's a little pebble that drops into the pool to attract his attention, and up pops the self. And Rafiki's a trickster. He tells him weird jokes, and he hits him with a stick a bunch of times, thank God, because someone really needs to. And he, he, he makes some stupid jokes about bananas and kind of entices Simba into following him, right? He, he lets him know that he has a secret and he entices Simba into following him. And so Simba's all, all of a sudden become interested in something. So if you ask yourself what the next developmental stage is and you really want to know, then all of a sudden you're going to become interested in things that might move you to the next stage. And that'll happen more or less unconsciously. So anyways, Rafiki entices him and then runs away. And Simba follows him. And, well, that's where he reveals himself as a sage. And then he tells Simba to follow him and he goes underground. And this is the initiation scene, right? Which we talked about at the beginning of the class. This is the descent into the underworld. And it's a, it's a prerequisite to radical, 
personality transformation. So anyways, he goes through this horrifying underground tunnel system where everything's all tangled up, which is, you'll know if you ever fall into chaos, that everything down there in chaos is tangled up. It's a tangled mess. And he's quite, and there's horrifying music going on in the background, and he goes deeper and deeper until Rafiki says, he finds a pool in the middle of the chaos, a deep pool, and that's another symbol of the self. It's, it's the deep unconscious. There's something down there that's alive that can be drawn up to the surface. And so Rafiki shows him the pool, and Simba, who's quite terrified at this point, looks in it, and the first thing he sees is he only sees himself. He only sees his own reflection. And Rafiki says, look deeper. Now you see what the animators do here. It's very cool. So there's Simba, and there's his reflection. But you see that is already half his father. And you look at the difference in the eyebrows and the, and the look. So there's a, there's a tightness of jaw and a firmness of face that's starting to manifest itself there. And that means that he's starting to see the man he could be beyond the adolescent. That's a good way of thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, well, there, you know, that's a whole different face, right? That's a seriously different face. That, everything's going in, and that, it's like, get out of my way, because things are going to happen around me. Very judgmental as well. So it's not, it's not naive by any stretch of the imagination. But, you know, we know his father's a good guy, and so there's something archetypal about this. And so he sees the man he could be reflected back to him and then that switches, that actually becomes a cosmic event and we switch up to the sky instead. And so Mufasa manifests himself basically as a solar deity. And he tells Simba that he's forgotten who he is, which is the son of a king, and that he should remember that and start acting like it. And that's an archetypal idea. So if you're just a useless adolescent, then you've forgotten who you are. And the consequence of that is that the state is going to fall, around, fall apart around you, and you're not going to do anything to fix it, and you're not going to be good for anything, and no one's going to be able to rely on you, and you're going to be all whiny and resentful. And then it, after that, it even gets worse. And so that's basically what Mufasa tells him. And so Simba is like blown away by this vision, right? Because he sees what he could be and also what he's not, which is pretty damn horrifying. So, anyways, the storm, so to speak, clears, and Rafiki comes up, and, and Simba's a lot more thoughtful, and not quite as whiny and resentful anymore, and Rafiki leaves. And so Simba now knows what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to stop being useless and take on the moral requirements of setting the kingdom straight. And so he runs back across the desert, there's all sorts of impressive music happening, and then he comes back to his kingdom, and it's not looking so good. And that's the consequence of his, uh, his abandonment of it, that's a big part of it, so now it's dead, but also his abandonment of it to nothing but malevolence and chaos. And so, he's pretty taken aback at what's happened, and that he exaggerates his guilt, or it should anyways. And uh, Nella shows up, and, and uh, they decide they're gonna do something about this.